Hello, everyone. During the podcast this week, uh, we discussed a little bit about some of the self-isolation that people are having to do because of the coronavirus stuff that's going around. And uh, we thought it'd be cool to do a video talking about some stuff that you could do while you're in self-isolation if you want to um, sacrifice yourself to the... Art to the exploit gods, I guess. Yeah. yeah. If, if you wanna, if you wanna <laughs> either get started, I mean, I'm sure there will be a few things in here for people that know what they're doing. But this is generally going to be oriented more towards just some some tasks you can do, some ideas for how you can spend your time uh, to learn about exploitation. Yeah, it's very beginner focused. Uh, and as you can see, our very first thing here, you can read our blog, which has summaries of our episodes, and that's about it. So not actually that useful. It has a write-up that I wrote a while ago for that. It has uh, the one write-up. Otherwise, it's <laughs> just our just our blog, or just our... Um, where is that? Our there, podcast, there's uh, your overviews. Or there's your write-up. You can read the binder write-up. Yeah. Nice long one. So, you know, you got some content to cover you for a little bit. <laughs> uh, but now that we got this, the shameless self-promotion out of the way, uh, we do have some, like, uh, courses, like Z was saying. Uh, it's a little bit more beginner-oriented. Uh, our first one is Open Security Training. They have some really good uh, classes. I've actually... I learned x86 uh, from Open Security Training. Oh, that is like... I think that's one of their worst courses I, I on know, here, too. You, that you is so dry. dry, so boring. I liked it, though. So, I, I, I mean, the thing fun. is, it covers what matters for <laughs> it. Because, I mean, you don't need to know how to do... Like, you don't need to be an expert at writing assembly to get into exploit development. You need to be able to read assembly. And th that's a pretty far distance from being able to write good assembly. So the whole course there, the intro to x86, is... Here's, like, the... is I think it's the top 20 most common instructions... Just like, you know, death by PowerPoint with the top 20 instructions in assembly. Uh, it, it is a really dry course. That's it. I tend to recommend uh, the introduction to software exploits. Like for anybody that wants to get started with doing binary level exploitation, that's my go-to resource to recommend. Uh, that's, that's the one by Corey, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's a course that like before hacking art of exploitation like the classic book recommendation uh before shell coder's handbook before pretty much anything that's the course i recommend um now i do recommend some of the books just on the side if you get stuck they're another another source of an explanation but i like that is the introductory uh resource that i recommend in general is that course and you get the lab material too to do it, right? Yeah. Like they so provide a download of the slides and the lab materials and all that. Yeah. So on this whole training page, um, you've got some of these courses you'll notice have a play button. That means they've got the videos up for you to download. But generally speaking, with all of them, you're going to have this access to the slides, uh, exercise code, and if there is a VM, they'll usually have the VM for you to download. Uh, that isn't always the case. Like um, exploits two, another worthwhile course uh they only Mostly have windows the exploit though. codes but that's because they can't just give you a copy of windows and the vm so you you get everything you need to follow along with these courses and i absolutely recommend taking the course watch the video do the exercises along with the students in the video um it's just a really good way to learn and i mean there's a lot of different topics here the other course that I can recommend is Life of Binaries, which is just... I've never done that one, actually. Yeah, so it's just kind of getting more of a foundational knowledge of how, like, binaries work, how they're loaded, uh, compilation process. Um, just kind of understanding, well, the life of a binary, and or it's not compilation process, sorry, linking, like, linking with dynamic library process, not compiling dynamic there, sorry, yeah. but... um. It's just it's just one of those courses like you're not necessarily learning a lot that's going to be directly applicable to like you're going to write your next exploit based on something in there. But it's that foundational knowledge that just helps you understand what's going on on a whole. Yeah, so I've done exploits one and the x86 ones. The exploits one is better. But what's really cool about these courses, <clears throat> sorry, uh, what's really cool about these courses is they're really immersive in the fact that 
you know, these courses are being taught to people on site, right? There's actually students in the videos and they're asking questions and stuff that um, you might be thinking while they're covering it. And you get to see the answers to that. I think that's kind of a cool insight that you don't always get. Um, and that's one thing I really liked, even about the x86 one. I think that's why I like the x86 one is some students brought up some really interesting questions and some of them that I hadn't even thought of. And the answers were like really neat. And uh, I, I learned some cool stuff in it. So I think that's why I liked it. Um, yeah, which is like, fair. Like, I, like I do actually recommend that x86 one, even though it's so dry. <laughs> I just give people the warning. It is really dry. Yeah. So the open security courses are open. Uh, open okay, security I, I training. It. And open I will say their website, courses, their website always did. like looks so sketchy. Like <laughs> yeah. it's HTTP. It's just like these black and white pages, but it, it is solid content. Yeah, there's like you, you no can, styling, but... You can like spend that. a lot of time on the stuff here, because even like the Exploits 1 course, um, if you go through the slides, there's actually a lot more content than just what's taught, and there's more challenges. So it, it's very heavy on like the lab and exercises. There's more exercises than what's just covered in the video, so you can spend a lot of time with some of these. And I think the videos alone probably come close to like 20 hours or so in content uh, alone. Actually, looking at here for software exploits, it's nine hours for uh, exploits one. It might be the x86 one I'm thinking of that ran a little longer because I think that ran over two days or something like so that. So did the x86, the x86 one's two days. Yeah, 12 hours for x86. Oh, okay. So or, sorry, little, exploits uh, one less is. Than I thought. Exploits one is also a two day. I want to say the reverse engineering one is three. Uh, okay. No, no, it's just got a lot of parts. Never mind. Uh, it's only six hours. Okay. Um, I will say with the exploits uh, courses, if you're interested in taking them, exploits one focuses a little bit more on like the Linux side and stuff like that. Exploits two, I think, is entirely Windows. Yeah, so well, it's exploits two, exploitation in the Windows environment. So yeah, so if you're not too interested in Windows exploits, you can probably get by with just exploits one. Uh, but if you're interested in the Windows, obviously you would want that second one. So yeah, that's it's worth still considering. pretty like fundamental stuff. I want to say it does like you know the SEH overwrites, um, and some stuff like that. Like it's still pretty fundamental and basic. Yeah, lab requirements, Windows XP era. Yeah. So, you know, it's not getting like really modern. It's or not anything. super modern, but it's still useful to know. And you need some of those building blocks to. Yeah. To well, that's get the, the thing. Uh, I mean, a lot of people look at the, the exploit material and it's like, you know, hacking artifact exploitation is still a common recommendation. And that came out, you know, how long ago? And I mean, yeah. the thing is, yes, it's old. And yes, you're in the true. You're not going to take these techniques and immediately just apply them to like your latest Chrome O day following exactly the same steps but what you do with modern exploits is still the same fundamental process you're still just getting control of your ip your pc register whatever uh you're still just getting that control um it's just now you have a bunch of other steps you need to take in order to get there yeah and just to kind of hijack off that um i had you know kind of an anecdote here i had a question asked a little while ago in the uh, reverse engineering discord server that we're in um somebody asked what's the point of learning about these older you know uh, attack strategies if they're completely foiled by newer mitigations so you know um uh let's say like shell coding you know putting doing a stack overflow and doing a shell code attack uh why do i need to learn that if pretty much everything uses non-executable stack nowadays and my answer to that is some software you will be surprised to find out actually doesn't employ some of the mitigations even mitigations that are like 10 or 15 years old by now um you know due to certain circumstances maybe they just don't enable them or they forget about them so it's going to be very useful for you to be able to uh see that and point that out and exploit that fact um and the other thing is uh, you need to understand how some of those older attacks worked to understand how to bypass those mitigations now um because they kind of give you that understanding of okay they yeah, well, I put think... this mitigation in place because people used to do this so this is this is why it makes sense that this new method works to get around that. You know yeah, what I mean? I think it, it helps you to know kind of how we got to where we are, which exactly. is by understanding kind of how some of those mitigations came about, you know, what was the old attack? And I mean, it is still, 
I've kind of used the anecdote of learning math. It's a lot easier to learn math if you learn your addition, you learn subtraction, you learn multiplication and division. You learn them separately, and then you learn about solving equations. You don't just start by solving an equation. You don't learn just jump the straight into calculus. Yeah, like you, you gotta you gotta get the building blocks to get there. Um, the next midi- uh, or uh, sorry, the next uh, <laughs> the topic. next mitigation, not, yeah, not the next mitigation. Uh, the next topic is actually one that you recommended. So I I actually haven't really looked at this one. So this one's gonna be mostly uh, you yeah, taking solo. Yeah. So- and one of the things with kind of our recommendations is we did try and choose things that were going to be at least somewhat enjoyable to play around with and not necessarily uh, sources like we don't have any of those books being recommended. Um, you know, trying to choose some things that you might find it easier to stick with. A support swigger, um, they're the ones that are behind the classic book recommendation of the Web Application Hacker's Handbook. Um what they've done here with the Web Security Academy is essentially instead of making a new book, they've got this academy that they update with new attacks, with labs for you to try out. And of course, you know, Port Swigger, they're known, it's Web Security Academy, they're known for the web stuff. Uh, so what they've got um, is, as I said, you've got various labs set up. I'll just click Access Control Vulnerabilities give you some detail about some of the issues talking through, and then they provide you labs to actually play around with. Okay, here's an issue. Now here's a lab to actually try it out. And they have a ton of labs, all free for you to access. Um, and they update this, but you know, for now, it, it is what it is. But there's plenty of content in here, plenty of stuff for you to learn with. Did we cover uh, Port Swigger on a recent episode, or am I thinking of something else? Um, I mean, the, the Port Swigger blog is one of the blogs that I do follow for topics, so we've definitely covered at least something related to this, and I've probably mentioned. I feel I've like probably you mentioned, mentioned at least the lab before here. Yeah, I feel like I have yeah. mentioned it. I couldn't tell you exactly which episode, but it's a good resource if you're looking kind of for more the web and not the binary. This is a good resource that's free and accessible. Yeah, seems pretty cool. Um, the next one is uh, NAND to Tetris. Um, so this one, you know, their tagline is building a modern computer uh, from first principles. So they've got like a bunch of projects, uh, 12 specifically, um, that take you all the way from Boolean logic to like a basic operating system. Um, they cover like a lot of low level stuff uh, with computers as you can guess with like yeah, the NAND the, name. The fundamental idea is going from having a NAND gate to building Tetris. So the entire process of going from building your well one understanding Boolean logic, building up like the really basic chips. Uh, and like well logic gates. You're not going to it literally like build chips. But it seems like something to be really like fun. Yeah, yeah. and it, it is. It's it's an enjoyable thing to go through. You've got and the notes to read along with everything. Um that kind of talks through everything but yeah the idea is just building up more of a computer science knowledge from first principles so from the most basic thing in this case they're starting from that NAND gate to actually building an operating system to implementing your own little tetris game your own little language with that and all of that it's it's a good course again it's not one of those things that you're going to write your exploit on the base of but i'm a big fan of making sure people take the time to get the fundamental knowledge that's necessary uh because it's really it, easy it kinda, to focus you know what it on it reminds me of it, it's not entirely related but it reminds me of your like uh when people are first learning like c and c plus plus you don't like people using ides you want them to learn how like the compiling and linking process works under yeah. the hood that's kind of reminds me of this in a way that you're kind of trying to get that lower level understanding uh of how things work at the basic level before jumping up to uh you know, serious, more serious projects, I guess. Yeah, like, I mean, it takes longer, but in the end, I believe you get a huge benefit from taking the time when you start. Because it's so easy, once you, um, with programming, uh, since you're speaking about C there, it's so easy, you know, if you start programming in, like, Python or even Java, to never Don't bother learn C learning C. Um, yeah. Well, we can debate that one. I would uh, say but, don't bother learning it as a first language, but it should be learned. So that's, what I want that, to that's going a little bit on, a, on an aside. I recommend C as a first language, but 
you, if you get stuck with it, if you don't get pointers, if you just you can't get through it, switch to something else. I do recommend C as a starter language, but I don't say like you must learn C first. Uh, my recommendation generally is give this a try. If you're stuck, if you just don't get it, because some people it just clicks. Like I mean, I'll say for myself, I like I hear a lot of people complain about learning pointers. Like I legitimately just it just clicked for me. And I've known a few other people where it's just kind of clicked. We just got it. And I'm sure there are other people out there like that. Um, and, you know, the language really wasn't that bad. Now, C wasn't my first language. My first language was QBasic. Um, Boomer. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I, a friend of mine brought it to school on a uh, floppy disk. So, yeah, Boomer, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but, um <sighs> Oh no, learning the first thing, I just tend to say, you know, give C a shot if you want to get into the exploits. If you're going into development, you don't care about security. C isn't necessary. It's so easy just to not bother with it, but you benefit a lot by understanding the lower level stuff. And this course, especially if you want to get into the exploit stuff, it helps to understand how the computer works. That helps you understand, you know, what these exploits are doing, which is kind of taking advantage of certain trusts that exist uh, in the system, in the CPU when it's reading that code. Like, um, so a course like this is just really useful to give you that fundamental knowledge, even if it's not going to help you with the exploitation itself. I've heard a lot of good things about Nanta Tetris. I'll be honest, I haven't done too much of it myself. I've dabbled in it a little bit, but I might actually start looking into it a little bit more just because I think, um, you know, doing stuff like this, like even like they have some VM stuff, um, you learn a lot going through it, even if the, you know, resulting project is something that's already been done or it's something that's not going to be ultimately very useful for a lot of people. What you learn while doing it is what's useful. And I think, you know, obviously, like, I still have stuff to learn. Everyone still has stuff to learn. And I think there's definitely still stuff I can learn from this course, too. So I might I might go through it, too, because uh, it looks pretty fun. And uh, yeah, yeah, I well, think like you're saying, the, those those building blocks are important. Yeah, well, speaking of fun, though, I do think the next topic here, Pwn Adventure, is definitely one of those things that can be quite fun. If you're into, like, game hacking, uh, this is basically a game that's meant to be hacked. Um, oh, no, are you familiar with it? Have you seen this before? I've seen it um, mostly through Live Overflow. Uh, Live Overflow oh, okay. oh, does yeah, a lot of, yeah, like, he gameplay did. videos of it and stuff like that. I haven't personally played it myself, I'm not really, I'm not too into game hacking, honestly. It's just not something that I could really hold my attention on. Yeah, it's um, not for me, but a lot of people do get started by looking at game hacking. Oh, yeah, I mean, sure. it's such a commonplace, either like game hacking or just the reverse engineering aspect. It's like games in general, I think, bring a lot of people into the hacking environment. Yeah, it's it's very closely tied in like yeah, the technology there's, there's area. There's similar skill set. I mean, it's a different skill set. But, like, the mindset, at least, is very similar when you're looking for the cheats. It's a good drive for reverse engineering. Yes, like, yeah. It's, very uh, good it's in, like... definitely a lot closer to the reverse engineering side, but... Yeah. But it, look, it looks really cool, and I think people would have fun going through it. Um, that being said, I think this this topic is a lot less focused on, like, the learning aspect than the ones we've already covered. Well, so it's less structured learning. It's yeah, more less structured learning. That's a good way. Here's to something for you to play with and figure out and take advantage of issues with, uh, rather than a really structured learning process. Um, and the next topic is kind of on the same idea. It's a sorcery pwn adventure. Um, I actually, better mute this. I think I remember you linking this to me before, but I uh, I just like kind of took a quick look at it. I didn't look at it too much. But I yeah, think you did so, this to me. Yeah, so this one, it's a game in the browser. Is it like a web assembly? Or... Uh, probably. But so the idea here, though, with this one is you've got this game. You can move around in it. Um, I just happened to time that with the earthquake in the game. So if you're wondering why it's shaking, that's not a bug. It's, <laughs> it's an animation, but... And effectively, I'll see if I can get in there, just enter Jailbreak Cave. And it has several CTF challenges. This was actually a CTF. I want to say... I want to say in like 17, 2017. I don't remember exactly when it was a CTF. Um, 
but essentially like you can pick up objects you can reprogram objects and it gets to the point where it's like you've got a door for example um uh, and you'll like not not pick the lock to the door but you'll you'll be able to modify the code to the door modify your input to exploit the program that runs the door or the lock or some challenge like that and has some actual ctf challenges in it but it's all meant to be played in this sort of nest style or super yeah no this is more nest styled game uh so i it's i it's really cool if you get a chance to play with that if it holds your attention like it is a lot more exploit development focused yeah uh, but it's not as good for just individual learning. Like, it's not as structured of a learning thing. This seems really cool. Uh, one thing I did want to add on the uh, Pony Island, uh, like the Pony Adventure thing, is the cool thing with that, too, is a lot of game hacking, especially when you're talking about, uh, you know, wanting to get help and stuff from Discord. Um, for the most part, you know, che cheating is, is banned, right? It's against TOS, so you'll get banned from a lot of servers for talking about it. Um, but with the Pony Adventure stuff, the game is meant to be hacked like that, so there's less of a stigma around it. So yeah, you'll still get cool banned if you're too. talking about it on Discord, though. Will Dis you? Discord isn't going to my... take the time to... Yeah, no, Discord probably, just right. doesn't like the topic at all. Which So just, you know, just be careful, I guess, if you're going to talk about that on Discord, then. Because that's I mean, it, it is technically allowed. Like, the game supports it and stuff, so the stigma isn't there. But, you know, if we're being honest there, like, Discord itself is pretty strict about that. It's going to be covered on the blanket. I was thinking originally, like, you might be safe from that. But, yeah, I guess thinking about it more discord's not really gonna care so uh you know if you're looking at that probably keep it off discord uh just to be safe um but yeah i just did want to say like that is another thing to consider that game hacking is kind of can be hard to break into just because there's a lot of stigma around it so that game is kind of cool that it allows you to explore those techniques but it, it doesn't you know have that stigma attached to it um but yeah, sorry. Uh, did you have anything more to say on uh, Pony Adventure? No, uh, I'm neither of them. I've kind of covered everything I wanted to say, so we can move on. Okay, fair enough. I just wanted to jump back quickly. Um, getting back into some more structured stuff, uh, we have the Embedded Security CTF as well. Um, I think you've me recommended this to me before, actually. Yeah, like, Micro personally. Corruption's another good learning CTF. Um, and it's got, I'm not going to sign up or log in on stream here, but it has a nice little UI. Like, it's another thing that's kind of meant to be done in the browser. So it kind of provides you with uh, the interface you need to kind of debug the program and exploit it just kind of all in the browser. So you don't need much extra, similar to uh, Sorcery. Yeah. I, I will take a, an opportunity from this topic to kind of ask you, thing with a lot of these uh ctfs like i think even this one i've seen write-ups published on uh you know certain you know websites and you'll see them posted on reddit and stuff like that um do you think it's beneficial for people learning to look up write-ups for ctf challenges for challenges like this that's a good question because um, I've I've seen arguments on both sides, like it kind of spoils it, and you kind of need that struggle to learn it. You do, um, but not. But you don't want to get frustrated to the point of quitting either. So it's and, and that, like, that I think is the important distinction. If you're going to quit, it's a lot better that you just look up a write up than quit. Quitting. It's better you yeah. keep going. Um, the struggle is real. The struggle is useful. I mean, frustration is a key part of this. Already that said, when you're learning, <laughs> like, on, on the other hand, though, especially with some of the more basic things, like, you know, you're just needing to learn some technique, you derive that technique yourself. Like, you're probably not going to forget it, but if you read it in a write-up, you might forget it, but there's also a fair chance if you read it in a write-up and then kind of do it yourself, it's going to stick with you just as well, but you went through it a lot quicker. So there is some use to reading the write-ups and just getting it that way. That said, when it comes to stuff that's kind of structured like this, I'd say your ideal case is just not to read the write-ups on it. When we're talking more just general CTFs, I'd be a little bit more flexible on that. Uh, but again, it's better that you stick it out regardless. So if you need to read it, if you're just too frustrated, fine. It's better that you're learning than yeah. not learning. 
I'd agree with that. Um, I will say though that if you're doing like a legitimate seat, like a timed CTF, uh, well, you're not going to have sources for that. I was thinking more like the war game oh, CTFs. Yeah, I'm not going like uh, saying you can look up write ups for that. But what I'm saying is, it is a legitimate uh, strategy to look up ex or uh, write ups of previous challenges that are similar to it. So, I mean, looking for write ups is still a valuable technique to have if you're looking to do CTFs in the future in an actual competitive environment. Obviously, in these more structured ones, it's it's not really as competitive, right? It's just you do it whenever you do it for your own personal experience. Um, but I think. You know, knowing what to look for and knowing uh, resources, uh, like resource areas for those types of write-ups could be a useful skill as well, just for uh, future competitive CTFs you do. Yeah, I thought that'd so, be worth mentioning. Um, that actually, since I thought what you were going to say in terms of the CTFs, uh, in terms of them being... Uh, in terms of the benefit there, one thing that I will mention is it is actually really useful to look at write-ups from old CTFs and try them out yourself, uh, which is actually a topic that I hadn't added to our plan here, uh, but Guy in a Tuxedo's Nightmare um, has a ton of just CTF challenges plus write-ups. Oh, um, yeah, you mentioned this before. I yeah, think. we've talked about this on stream before. Uh, yeah, but I'm going to bear it here. This is a really nice structured thing to just give you some challenges to go play around with. So it's like, hey, I want to learn about, uh, you know, ROP. You know, here's some challenges in it. Here's, you know, especially SIG ROP. That's some that isn't necessarily covered too much. There's there's a few challenges that you can actually use that on. Uh, you know, there's some heap stuff. It's just a really good resource. So I'll add that in there kind of as another CTF thing. Uh, I mean, this is, like I said, it's on GitHub, um, you know, github.io, there's the, uh, but if you go to the actual GitHub, you're able to, uh, there we go, you're able to find, like, all the files that you need, uh, not yeah. just what's on the low website. Yeah, and that's another one where I think at the time when you brought it up on the podcast, uh, that's a good reference just to have bookmarked for when you're doing CTFs, too, just uh, for references, so... Yeah. Um, yeah, it's cool that you brought that up. Uh, keeping on the you know topic of uh, structured CTFs, we also have exploit exercises. Uh, this one, this one's a fairly common recommendation. Actually, uh, the original went down sadly. I think it went down like last year at some point. Yeah, I think uh, it's this been a, a couple of years now. Actually, has it? I thought it went. down. I feel like it it's been up. a. Well, I think it, it went no, down when, and came back up, and then went down again. But that but, was even longer ago. I, I want to oh, say that okay. was even seventeen. Maybe, okay, I'm, maybe, maybe my, I'm mistaken. My, uh, my dates might be wrong my here. My time but, referencing is off. But this is definitely, I, I mean, it's more likely mine's off. Uh, but uh -huh. um, this is something I love to recommend um, in three different ways. One, if you don't know anything about binary exploitation, there's this Nebula server. And so the way this works is you basically go, they've got several servers. You go, you download the server itself, and you can run it in like a local, uh, local VM. Um, and yeah. you SSH into it or whatever. You could technically use its its own screen, but uh, generally speaking, you're going to want SSH into it and uh, basically just attack all these different levels. Uh, but it's self-hosted. Now, there's several different servers here, and what I really love about Exploit Extra is it's actually their easiest server. Uh, the Nebula server is mostly just like really common simple not super like low level issues uh so i tend to recommend nebula if you've got somebody who has some programming experience like knows a little bit about security hasn't really done c hasn't done the binary level stuff just you want to get a sense of what it's like uh to actually do works like a vulnerability researcher give nebula a try that's going to give you the exposure without requiring the same depth of knowledge that some of the other things require. Uh, Nebula just has a bunch of issues that it gives you enough information for like, uh, you have to, like, I just pulled up level six here randomly. The Flag Flago 6 account credentials came from a legacy Unix system. So it gives you enough of a hint that now you have to go look into well, what's different between how you know, it was done in the past for the credentials. Like, why are, Why is that weak? Why does that matter? And it gives you enough hints in Nebula to know what to look for. 
uh, to know what type yeah. of research you need to do. So it gives you a really good feel for what it's actually like to do the work without needing to necessarily spend as much time or have as much experience. Uh, but I think it's just a really great box to play with. I personally really like Protostar. Um, what's cool about these VMs, though, is a, a lot of these, like, uh, these virtual machine-based CTF challenges, a lot of them are, like, boot to root style. So you have to complete the previous challenge to get to the next challenge, which is cool. But it's also cool to have the other ones where you can just kind of play with any challenge you want whenever you want. And that's how these VMs are structured. Each challenge has its own login account on the box. You don't have to have solved all the previous challenges to be able to solve uh, a challenge that you're interested in. You can just kind of uh, go to that challenge page, log into that account and do it. Uh, you don't need to uh, you know, do that boot to root style, which could be useful. Um, because Protostar, you know, they have different challenges like uh, stack-based buffer flow, buffer overflows and heap-based buffer overflows. So, like, if you're already familiar with stack and you don't want to go through all the stack ones, you can do, like, a format string or a heap challenge. Um, you can just kind of do whatever you want there. It's it's kind of you can pick and choose. So that's what I, I like about uh, these VMs as well. You know, Protostar is, uh, again, uh, the first recommendation I have with people getting started is doing that intro to security or sorry, intro to software exploit course from open security training. What mm -hmm. I recommend people follow that up with is Protostar or Nebula and Protostar. Generally, I'd say do Nebula if you like, if you kind of enjoy that, do the software exploits course, then do Protostar as like your next thing. Because generally speaking, everything you need to know to do all of the Protostar challenges is covered in the intro to software exploits course. Um, at least everything I can think of is all covered in that. So Protostar is just like a great next step to start putting into practice. Yeah. So Protostar is like another classic one. Uh, really fun to do. Um, Rop Emporium is one that I, I can't remember if we've covered it on the podcast, but I know we've definitely talked about it in a server when somebody asked about something on Discord. Yeah, um, I definitely, again, recommend it fairly frequently. Yeah, so return-oriented programming is one of those things that I think is hard for a lot of people to wrap their heads around. I know it was really hard for me um, at first. You know, it's just a it's a weird concept. It's not something you'll ever really encounter just as a developer or a programmer. It's kind of a it's a weird machine. Yeah, and so, I think it it helps. Like this is another one of those places where I think it helps understand the past too, like kind mm -hmm. of how we got here from like the. Uh, well, th and that is something like Rob Emporium does actually start you off with just doing like a return to win, like which is essentially getting close to like your classic just return to libc um, and things like that. Like it's just knowing the history, I think helps a little bit. And Rob Emporium kind of walks you through what you need. Um, it doesn't just jump you or throw throw you right into Rob or right into it, like it the full scale you into it. it gets yeah. your feet wet. Yeah. So they've got a bunch of different challenges. Uh, you can go to their like all challenges page. Oh, it's a zip file, so I can't look at it. I thought it was hosted on the site, but um, yeah, they've got a lot of like uh, different stuff you can look at, and it's good for getting your feet wet because, like I said, ROP can be hard to uh, you know wrap your head around. So this can kind of help there. Um, we'll we'll wrap up our little mini well, show. Well, just with before you do that, I will say one of the other nice things about Rob Emporium is it focuses on using, or not focuses, but it uses 32-bit and 64-bit binaries. Oh, uh, like all the challenges get both of them because there is a big difference between 32-bit and 64 exploitation. Uh, 64 being a lot more difficult than just your classic 32-bit just because of the normal calling convention. Um, but yeah, I figure I would mention that. That's another thing. Kind of, you know, take the time to do both of them. So you'll That's kind of learn point. your fundamentals in 32 and you'll get more what modern stuff's going to look like in 64. That's a good point because quite a few of the stuff we've covered already is mostly 32-bit. Like I think Protostar challenges are 32-bit. Yeah, well, it um, helps to start off with the 32-bit where you just don't have to worry about filling in the registers. You can just do it all on the stack. Yeah. It helps, like, again, it's building blocks, just adding on bits of knowledge, adding on techniques, adding on bypasses, just slowly adding things on to build up your knowledge rather than jumping right into the more complicated stuff. Yeah. So getting to the quote you mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to end off our little mini show with uh, a bit of self-promotion of a site that uh, Z and I 
uh, both run. And that quote that you mentioned earlier was the frustration being a key part of exploit research. And you um, must embrace it accordingly. Yeah. The so uh, part effect. So uh, Hex 539, it's a little CTF site we run. It's not like a timed CTF or anything like that. We do have leaderboards, but um, you know, it's just an ongoing thing. You can kind of do it whenever you want. And uh, we have like these challenge arenas uh, that all have like you know, easy, medium, hard, and very hard is basically how our challenge, challenge arenas go. Yeah, uh, we I keep mean, it in, like I... a Lord of the Rings theme, the Shire to Mordor, you know, kind of get yeah, a bit I, of I don't fun think spin of it. We don't have anything that is insanely difficult. What I've really tried to do when selecting challenges that we brought up on here was generally try and choose challenges that were interesting, that had somewhat interesting solutions. Not all of them. Some of them some are just intended to. Some of them are just intended to kind of teach something in particular, like uh, the crypto cookies challenge is just a challenge that I tend to use um, when I'm showing people just kind of an interesting crypto attack is like a beginner crypto attack. This is something I'll kind of show them as a realistic thing that I could walk them through in, you know, 20 to 40 minutes. Uh, but it's it's kind of a real feeling challenge. So some of them is just about that. Um, and some of it is just really some interesting things. Temporary notes was based on something I actually found on an assessment. I'm like, I've never seen that before. That'd make a that cool would, CTF challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of where it came from. And I used to kind of use this 0x0539. And before that, I had a couple other domains to do like a yearly challenge site, like a set of challenges. And I just got tired of updating it every year. So I don't think we've added any new challenges here in in a little while. In no. at least a year. <laughs> probably probably we'll a good bit some, longer. But I am going to get around to it. I actually did write a challenge Um, actually just uh, last weekend. Oh, okay, there we um, go. it's not added on there yet. Um, but I actually have I've done something recently. Uh, but yeah, we've just got some challenges there. Obviously, there are tons of challenge websites. Obviously, we're going to plug our own here since this is one we've put a little bit of work into. But and I think there's some fun challenges. Bias, is, like obviously we're biased, but you yeah, know, I think there's some biased. fun challenges still. Um, well, like but... I said, I definitely chose challenges that I thought were interesting in some way. I mean, yeah. definitely at the on the in the Shire, they're all pretty simple. But um, I mean, just pointing I, out kind of a few favorites, though. I will say, like, um, if I had to point one out in Shire, I'd have to say new location. I think that was yours. Yeah, that one was yours. Yeah, it was an issue that I'd seen before as well. A few of my challenges are based on issues I've seen in like real world software that I kind of tried to get ported into like a challenge bite-sized format yeah uh yeah new location was uh was a fun one yeah and then i'm i'm of course a little bit biased but i have two challenges here lucky feeling is here in fangorn forest and that one was fun yeah. and a lucky feeling fixed is like i patched the original issue in it and introduced another one uh, and that one's over in mordor yeah. i mean i'm biased but i do like those two challenges temporary notes the one i just talked about actually being a a uh, real an issue I found and then just made it into a challenge. Uh, those are kind of some of my favorites out of this. I don't know if you've got any favorite challenges. Or I guess if I had to say some that weren't mine, I do like compressor, but it takes a lot of time to do. Yeah, I mean, I really liked your uh, Ready Player One uh, reverse engineering challenge, partially because I like like the Ready Player One book and stuff. So you know, the theme of it was kind of kept me engaged in it, um, and. Uh, yeah, I, I liked your um, A Lucky Feeling fix as well. I will say probably the hardest challenge for anybody who's listening, who's like familiar with exploitation and reversing and wants a hard challenge would probably be Elementary VM. Uh, it's, you know, as you can guess by the name, it has to do with reverse engineering a virtual machine. It's probably the most difficult challenge we have on there at the moment. Yeah, I mean, we don't have a lot of pwn challenges that actually result in you popping a shell. And that's just been because I've, kind of keep putting off actually building up a proper sandbox environment to let people grab a shell on these. Um, I don't, I'm not sure we if do any of these, two, I yeah, I, there might be a couple. I kind of just, you know, said screw it and put in like the basics, but I, I'd want to do a little bit more that results in popping a shell. Yeah. I'm not but sure it's... which of these would actually, I'm just looking over the list. 
lost profile might, but I can't remember. It's been a while since I made that challenge. No, I but think yeah, it just like, prints the fr flag. But but yeah, maybe. it's just some challenges. There are other challenge sites too. I mean, you can Google and find a ton of them. We're just plugging our own because we can. Yeah, and it's it's an ongoing project. Like we're we're going to be adding new challenges. Uh, maybe I'll even try to get Eventually, one on there tonight. One day. No, I, I'll try to get one on there tonight. Screw it, dude. I'll get one on there. Um, but yeah, we also have a Discord attached to it where you can get like ranks and stuff as you get more points. You know, we got kind of a cool little system going on there. So if you want to check it out and do some uh, fun challenges, uh, obviously we're biased, but they're still fun, whatever. Um, you know, you can check out that site. But like Z said, there's a bunch of sites and we've plugged a few other ones uh, previously too that you can look at. Um, but that that's pretty much all of the, I think, recommendations we have. I don't know if you have any last minute ones that you might have just thought of when we were... No, uh, uh, I brought it. up the one that I had, the Nightmare. Yeah, okay, I figured. So, um, yeah, hopefully that's enough to kind of keep people entertained while you're self-isolating. Hopefully we won't have to be self-isolating for too much longer. I mean, hopefully this only lasts like a month or two. <laughs> but I, I think that's wishful thinking. I think this yeah, coronavirus well, crap is going to, you know, happen for a while. But We'll see um, what happens, but yeah. you know, I figure we toss out some resources. Um do a quick little video, you know, outside of the podcast. Um, yeah, we're going to try to do a bit more of, of this type of content, you know, uh, content outside of the podcast. Like pretty much all of our YouTube and stuff like that is all the podcast, except for like one video. So we're going to try to do some more like uh, outlying content. And this is probably, this is like the first of that. Um, so just keep a lookout for that uh, on our on our channel and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, that pretty much concludes our, uh, our little recommendations for you know, stuff to do uh, during self-isolation. Yeah, I will add. I mean, if people have some other recommendations, feel free to drop that in the comments too. I mean, I'm I'm always looking for new resources to recommend to people also. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, um, you can catch us on our podcast as well. Uh, we do them every Monday. We actually just did one today. So uh, Monday, you know, 3 p.m. Eastern. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you can catch us on our podcast or uh, catch any future VODs that we're going to have up on our YouTube channel. And uh, you can also join our Discord if you want to get involved with that and, you know, uh, you know, just talk about some resources you find as well. Um, but yeah, uh, that pretty much concludes this video.